the truth of Christianity, including the saving gospel message of Christ, are rejected by the atheist. The atheist claims he or she does not believe in God because they are not convinced by the arguments for God's existence. In Holy Scripture, Christians are exhorted to give a defense of the faith, that is, to do apologetics. However, most of the time when Christians have sought to do so, they have used faulty apologetic methodology, that is, a faulty method of defending and arguing for the Christian faith. For most of their arguments, if true, only establish a God, but not the Christian God they believe in. Moreover, often they will argue for the probability of the existence of a God, and yet in their day-to-day -day life, they don't live as though God only probably exists. They know God exists. All men know God exists. Moreover, when they endlessly give atheists evidence to autonomously weigh, they place God on the stand as if atheists were the judge and God was on trial in regards to if the evidence proves he exists. This is not honoring to God. Often they will allow atheists to assume the validity of their reasoning when weighing evidence without noting the fact that reasoning, morality, uniformity of nature, laws of logic, and human dignity are impossible apart from the Christian worldview. They also put on a mask of neutrality at times, pretending as though they were neutral to the atheist position and arguments, when really they are not, since regenerate Christians are committed to Christ. They also allow atheists to claim and pretend that they are neutral and open-minded to Christian arguments, when really they are not, but instead hostile to the idea of God, and they have their own commitments and presuppositions that inform their thinking, in the way they interpret the world as well, such as naturalism, materialism, the validity of autonomous reasoning, and the idea that all things including God must be empirically proven, etc. When giving unregenerate men evidence, the traditional apologists ignore the biblical fact that unsaved people will always reject it in hostility, since they are not neutral, but they unrighteously suppress the revelation God gives everyone in nature and their constitution that shows them God exists. I and reformed presuppositional apologists of the Christian faith are regretful this takes place, and we offer instead the biblical presuppositional apologetic, which takes care of all these problems and proves the specific Christian God in an honoring manner, leaving the unbeliever with no ability to reason or argue apart from the Christian worldview. Which worldview makes human experience intelligible? Which worldview makes human experience intelligible? Which worldview comports with those things that the Christian and the non-Christian both say or do? Earlier today I told you that though there is an antithesis in principle, unbelievers cannot work in God's world according to their own um, philosophy. They are going to be inconsistent. They are going to say things and do things that uh, do not comport with what they profess about the nature of reality and how we know and how we should live our lives. Presuppositional apologetics is a reformed apologetic developed by the Christian philosopher Cornelius Van Til, who was indebted to earlier Christians such as St. Augustine, Abraham Kuyper, and Hermann Bovink in crucial areas. This apologetic was then championed by Van Til's student Greg L. Bonson, the philosopher, theologian, and debater. Bonson's students then carried on this apologetic as well. It is also championed by Van Til's other students such as the philosophers and theologians K. Scott Oliphant, John Frame, and many others. That atheists hate God proves they know he exists, and that what Holy Scripture says about unbelievers' attitude towards God is true. A fifth grade kid in South Florida getting a whole lot of attention tonight. He has people talking. His family decided to battle the teacher who told him he couldn't read his Bible at school. The man who created Family Guy, Seth MacFarlane. So, uh, can we watch a clip? This is uh, you uh, doing a number on Jesus. <laughs> Romans 8.7 says the unbelieving mind is, quote, hostile to God, unquote. Colossians 1.21 says atheists are hostile in mind towards God. In Proverbs 8.36, we're told the unbeliever hates God and loves death. Thus, if professed atheists give evidence of actually hating God, this validates the Christian position that they already know God is their enemy and proves scripture to be true. Accompanying the rise of secularism are numerous things that contradict God's law, such as homosexuality, gay marriage, transgender acceptance, and abortion. There is a real push to normalize these things and criticize those who oppose them as bigots. If atheists hate God and his law and wish to rebel against them, we would expect them to try to standardize things that explicitly violate God's law. This is exactly what is taking place. And in the context of rallies, protests, or events concerning these issues, hateful anti-God or anti-Christ propaganda and rhetoric are often present. Unbelievers are so passionate about these issues God has spoken to because of their hatred towards and thus rebellion against God. This is nothing but a rebellious war against God's created order and a crusade for autonomy from God. Many professing atheists often come out and say things clearly indicating they hate God and Christ, 
even though they outwardly assert to not believe they exist. A lot of people come up here and they thank Jesus for this award. I want you to know that no one had less to do with this award than Jesus. <laughs> he didn't help me a bit. If it was up to him, Caesar Milan would be up here with that dog. So all I can say is, S Jesus, this award is my God now! While Christopher Hitchens professed not to believe in God, the title of one of his books was God is Not Great. Similarly, while Dan Barker professes not to believe God exists, he nevertheless cannot help but show his deep hatred for him. For example, he wrote, If the biblical heaven and hell exist, I would choose hell, having to spend eternity pretending to worship a petty tyrant who tortures those who insult his authority would be more hellish than baking in eternal flames. There is no way such a bully can earn my admiration. Also, Barker's supposed unbelief in God does not stop him from passionately attacking him in the following harsh way. But I do reject Jesus Christ. He is not my Lord. If he did exist, I would tell him to his face that if he created a hell, then he should go to hell. He's an immoral person. Such vitriolic, passionate attacks make no sense if these men do not believe God even exists and that God is just some fairy tale people should pay no mind to. If these men truly do not believe God exists, why do they consistently exhibit this level of hatred towards him? Many are being misled by such people and following suit. No, no I'm not religious. Oh, I don't blame you. Wouldn't be. Uh, I, uh, I'm an atheist. I, I hate God. I don't... That atheists know God exists but hate him is also concordant with the findings of John Coster in his book The Atheist Syndrome. Coster demonstrated the leading figures or pillars of modern unbelief such as Huxley, Darwin, Nietzsche, and Freud, hated and sought to lead people away from God because they associated the God they knew with their abusive fathers they hated. Based on his research, Coster concluded these pillars of modern unbelief projected the stigma their fathers caused them onto God and this contributed to modern unbelief the way they did as a way to get back at God, i.e. their heavenly father. Indeed, it is not that people do not believe in God, they always have and will, they simply do not like God. The following admission from popular atheist Michael Shermer highlights the point. What finally tipped my belief into skepticism was the problem of evil. A just and loving God who had the power to heal would surely heal Marine, Shermer's injured girlfriend. He didn't. He didn't. Or consider how in a radio debate the atheist author Lewis Wolpert admitted he gave up belief in God when God wouldn't help him find his cricket bat as a child. Or one could also note how the atheist writer John Loftus left Christianity because he blamed God for allowing him to cheat on his wife and then get exposed for it. He said everybody write Jesus on bold letters. So what I did was I wrote Jesus just like this. And then afterwards he said everybody put it on the floor. So we took it out, put it on the floor, and he had us all stand up. And once we were standing up, he said, stomp on it. And that's when I picked up the paper from the floor and put it right back on the table. Ryan says he couldn't believe what the instructor was saying to the class. Interestingly, Science 2.0 put out, quote, Atheism is psychologically impossible because of the way humans think, says Graham Lawton, an avowed atheist himself, writing in The New Scientist. They point to studies showing, for example, that even people who claim to be committed atheists tacitly hold religious beliefs. This is exactly what the inspired Book of Romans says, quote, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. Moreover, a research team out of Finland, led by the University of Helsinki psychologist Marjana Lindman, conducted two experiments, the first with 16 atheists and 13 religious people, and the second with 19 atheists. They quote, examined whether atheists exhibit evidence of emotional arousal when they dare God to cause harm to themselves and their intimates. Unquote. The atheists verbally read a number of statements while skin conductance data was collected using electrodes placed on two of their fingers. This study was published in the International Journal for the Psychology of Religion. The arousal levels were the same for both atheists and the religious. The levels were higher for both when they dared God to do something negative, and lower when neutral statements or statements such as, I wish something bad would happen, were read. In the report, we are told the religious and atheists, quote, become equally emotionally aroused when daring God to do unpleasant things, unquote. The study affirmed, quote, atheists were less comfortable with daring God than with daring a more nebulous and impersonal fate or simply contemplating the distressing events, unquote. 
Moreover, it found, quote, atheists' explicit beliefs conflict not only with their behavior, but also with their effective reactions, unquote. The study relayed one of the four possible explanations of the evidence is that while atheists profess to disbelieve in God, their profession conflicts with their actual subconscious belief. As the study puts it, quote, atheist explicit beliefs may differ from the implicit reactions that exist outside of conscious awareness, unquote. If this is true, it coheres with what scripture teaches regarding all men knowing God and yet suppressing their knowledge of him. While the atheist convinces himself that he does not believe in God and professes such, inwardly he knows God exists and shows evidence of this. Scripture is very clear that man has always had a natural knowledge of God from a very young age since the beginning of man's existence because creation, common grace, and being in God's image all testify of God's existence. However, atheists have claimed small children, unaided by indoctrination, do not have a natural knowledge of God. Indoctrination, they claim, is what leads a child to theistic beliefs later in life. For example, atheist writer George Smith wrote, quote, The man who is unacquainted with theism is an atheist because he does not believe in a God. This category would also include the child with the conceptual capacity to grasp the issues involved, but who is still unaware of those issues. The fact that this child does not believe in God qualifies him as an atheist, unquote. Yet, science agrees with the biblical position and refutes such unbelieving writers. Research associate at Oxford Center for Anthropology, Dr. Justin L. Barrett, put out a book in 2012 called Born Believers, where he puts forth the science that demonstrates children naturally believe in God, as Holy Scripture proclaims. Barrett notes, quote, Evidence exists that children might find especially natural the idea of a non-human creator of the natural world, possessing superpower, super knowledge, and super perception, and being immortal and morally good. These findings are interesting because scripture also affirms people naturally know God exists and is powerful and glorious, has a divine nature, and is morally good. In chapters 2 and 3 of the book, Barrett shows children come into this world naturally geared to see order, purpose, and intentional design behind the world, indicating their belief in God. On page 46, Barrett cites an experiment by the psychologist Deborah Kelman, where four to five-year-old children affirmed men, women, babies, tigers, and trees, etc., were designed and had purpose in the same way that genes and rings created by men do. Barrett concludes, quote, Children's minds are naturally tuned up to believe in gods generally, and perhaps God in particular, unquote. This is what scripture affirms. According to a Pew Forum survey, 38% of people who identified themselves as atheists or agnostic went on to admit they believe in a god or a universal spirit. Thus, about 4 in 10 atheists and agnostics admitted they believe in god or a universal spirit. The biblical fact that even those who are not outwardly Christians know deep down that God exists coheres with those honest enough to admit this. Jonathan McKee reports the following concerning the Christian author Lee Strobel, quote, in 1993, Lee Strobel admitted that as an atheist, he was morally adrift, but secretly wanted an anchor. In a personal interview with him, he told me he always knew God was real. He just suppressed that truth, knowing that admitting God's reality would require a change in lifestyle." Unquote. In his book on overcoming addiction, J. Charles Roberts stated, Underneath the facade of atheism, I always knew there was a God. He just seemed so far away and inconsequential to the lifestyle I had chosen. The poet Luchner Pierre similarly wrote, quote, Ever since I was a young child, deep down in my heart, I always sensed God's existence before I started going to different churches." Unquote. The fact is, all men know God exists when they look at nature and because they are in God's image, yet the quote-unquote atheists suppress their knowledge of God. Now, knowledge would be impossible if atheism were true. We are not saying atheists do not know things. We are saying atheists cannot account for knowing things unless they presuppose the Christian worldview, which they do deep down. This is because if atheism were true, then the universe and reality would be nebulous, chaotic, unpredictable, irrational chance. An atheist universe would destroy the possibility of knowledge. Order, rationality, possibility, and probability, all things required to attain true knowledge, are inconsistent in an atheist universe. Yet, atheists do know things and assume the ability to achieve knowledge because they borrow from the Christian worldview without giving God glory or credit. We know this because they live and act assuming the universe is rational, orderly, predictable, etc. Yet the universe can only exist as such if the Christian worldview is true. The unbeliever knows this deep down. Mantell's approach to presupposition is that it is a precondition of intelligibility and therefore it can be argued for indirectly. You can reduce your opponent to absurdity. You can do an internal critique of the unbeliever's philosophy to show that on that philosophy he couldn't know anything at all. And beyond that, 
that his reasoning, his, his appeal to history and science and other things has all along been assuming your philosophy as a way of arguing against your philosophy. Atheistic utilization of rationalism, that is reason or manipulation of the laws of logic, using intellectual or deductive criteria, and empiricism, that is knowledge being based on sense perception, is viciously circular, resulting in faulty theories of knowledge, that is epistemologies. Take rationalism for example. If the atheist says he knows things because of reason, he is presupposing his reasoning is valid as his ultimate commitment or starting point for thinking. If asked how he knows his reasoning is valid, he will have to utilize his reasoning to prove the validity of it. He assumes the validity of reason when using reason to prove it is valid. This is a vicious circularity, rendering his foundation for knowledge erroneous since reason itself is not self-verifying. It is a bad circularity. All ultimate authorities must authorize themselves, lest they be shown to be unworthy of acceptance. Reason does not authorize itself since it does not itself affirm it is valid or true. The Christian's starting point for thinking, that is God and his revelation on the other hand, do. In John 14, 6, Jesus says he is the truth, and 2 Timothy 3, 16-17 says scripture is true and inspired by God. As Greg L. Bonson wrote, quote, The Christian's starting point, it should then be observed, provides the precondition for intelligible experience and meaningful thought, rather than destroying the epistemological enterprise, for it teaches that man was created to think God's thoughts after him, and thereby know the truth. This is interesting because a common argument against presuppositional apologetics is that it is circular to assume the existence of God in order to prove the existence of God. Critics claim this since we say, one must assume God in order to account for what we know to be true, regarding reasoning, knowledge, moral absolutes, laws of logic, uniformity of nature, and human dignity. This is, according to the incorrect unbeliever, blind faith, and arguing in a circle. Yet, as John Frame points out, quote, the unbeliever too has presuppositions that he does not question, and that govern every aspect of his thought and life. Thus, in a relevant sense, he too has faith. He too argues in a circle. The non-Christian has no basis for trusting reason, except his blind faith. If this world is ultimately the product of chance plus matter, of space and time, why should we assume that events in our head will tell us anything reliable about the real world? The Christian, though, knows that God has given reason to us as a reliable tool for knowing him, the world and ourselves." Unquote. God's revelation is the only viable foundation of knowledge or starting point for thinking. Revelation, as Greg L. Bonson explains, is, quote, "...the personal supernatural act of God's self-communication, by which he actively makes himself and his will known to men." There is general revelation, which refers to God revealing himself in nature, and then there is special revelation, which refers to God revealing himself in Holy Scripture. A proper starting point or foundation for knowledge must be based on God's perfect knowledge as found in this divine revelation. Because of God's creation of and control over the universe, Christians have a basis to know that reasoning is a valid instrument, unlike the atheist, since God gave man reason as a tool in the context of an orderly, logical universe that allows him to come to knowledge. Unless you presuppose the Christian worldview, you cannot account for the validity of reasoning or the ability to come to true knowledge. Because atheists believe knowledge is possible, do know things, and assume their reasoning is valid, they prove they know God and depend on Him for these things. This is why Colossians 2.3 says, In whom Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Unbelievers know things because of Christ, but they do not acknowledge Christ. Atheists reason because God enables that activity by his sovereign creation of and rule over the world and universe, which we learn about in general and special revelation. It is because atheists know God and know about this that they trust in their reasoning abilities as able to bring them to knowledge. Yet the atheists do not admit reasoning is only possible because of Christ. Why? Ephesians 4, 17-18 explains it is because of the, quote, futility of their minds, unquote, in light of the fact that unbelievers, quote, are darkened in their understanding alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, due to their hardness of heart. It is because unbelievers are fallen in nature, darkened in their thinking, and hard-hearted, that they profess that they can come to true knowledge apart from God, even though they do not truly believe that deep down. Atheists borrow from the Christian worldview, the only system of thought that can account for the validity of reasoning and the possibility of knowledge. This is why the inspired Solomon affirmed, quote, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. In order to have a basis for knowledge, one must start with God and His revelation, not autonomous human reason. This is also why Psalms 94.10 says it is God, quote, who teaches man knowledge, unquote. Christianity is thus true because of the impossibility of the contrary. It is impossible for Christianity to not be true 
because it alone provides the only foundation for reason men utilize, and the knowledge men have. Unless Christ is the Lord of one's reasoning, one cannot even account for reasoning or knowledge. As Bonson noted, apart from the self-attesting Christ of Scripture, his, the unbeliever's thinking, based on his autonomous presuppositions, loses meaning, coherence, and intelligibility. Christianity will be offered to him not simply because it affords with facts and logic, but because facts and logic could not be meaningful without it. Christianity is not simply as reasonable as other options, or even slightly more so. It is the only reasonable position for man to hold. The same can be said with regard to the unbeliever who views empiricism as his ultimate authority or foundation for knowledge. Empiricists say sense perception or observation is what leads to all knowledge. However, it must be asked, how does the unbeliever know from his senses that sense perception leads to all knowledge? Did he sense that somewhere? Did his observation of nature detect this idea? Obviously not. Moreover, when did the empiricist observe it has always been true at all times that all knowledge is gained only through sense perception? When and how did he sense that in nature? What is more, unbelieving empiricists cannot account for trusting in sense perception, since in atheism the universe would have to operate under nebulous, chaotic, unguided, unpredictable, random chance. Such a universe could result in the possibility of the change of his senses from being able to correctly observe reality to unable to correctly observe it. Relying on senses to bring one to knowledge only makes sense if God and his revelation are the ultimate foundation for knowledge or the starting point in thinking. This is because God's revelation confirms he sustains, regulates, and guides the universe, whereby it is not chaotic, unpredictable, and random. With God and his revelation as the foundation for knowledge, we know sense perception can always be a valid tool. God created man to sense things and to know things through observation. By trusting that his senses can bring him to knowledge, the unbeliever shows he knows God deep down as the one who enables the continual validity of the senses to bring one to knowledge. Yet the atheist suppresses his knowledge of God due to his hatred for him, thereby not giving him the credit he is due. In sum, Van Til stated, It is the firm conviction of every epistemologically self-conscious Christian that no human being can utter a single syllable, whether in negation or affirmation, unless it were for God's existence. Thus, the transcendental argument seeks to discover what sort of foundations the house of human knowledge must have, in order to be what it is. The critic might ask, why doesn't Islam, for example, provide the necessary precondition for knowledge and reason? The answer is the Quran, unlike the Bible, isn't a book that deals with such issues. The Quran is merely 114 surahs of petty stories, not theological or philosophical discourse. Now I am going to thoroughly address this question. As affirmed, Christianity accounts for moral absolutes, since morals are based on God's eternal nature and character. See Leviticus 19.1-2 and 1 Peter 1.16. It also accounts for why men know right from wrong and live and speak as though morality is absolute, even though atheism does not justify such behavior. This is because God writes the works of his law on their hearts. See Romans 2, 14-15. Though men do rebel and suppress or distort their knowledge of good and evil at times, God is the absolute and personal creator who is responsible for the personal obligation men feel to abide by moral absolutes. Christian theism accounts for why we feel and live as though humans have dignity or value, since it affirms all men know God, Psalms 19.1, Romans 1, 17-23, and that men are in God's image, see Genesis 1.26 and on, that they belong to God and are accountable to God, see Proverbs 16.4, Romans 11.36, and Revelation 4.11. Christianity accounts for the immaterial nature of the laws of logic, since we do not claim that all that exists in the universe is matter and by noting they are unchanging eternal expressions of the attributes of the unchanging eternal God, see 2 Timothy 2.13. This is deduced from the fact that all knowledge and wisdom comes from God, see Proverbs 1.7, 9.10, Colossians 2.3. The Bible affirms God does not contradict himself, see 2 Corinthians 1.18, and that it is impossible for God to lie, see Hebrews 6.18. This is because the law of non-contradiction is part of his nature, Scripture affirms the laws of logic which reflect God's nature. See Exodus 3.14, Matthew 12.30, Luke 6.43. Christianity also accounts for the uniformity of nature by appealing to God's sovereignty and provision. See Nehemiah 9.6, Matthew 5.45, Ephesians 1.11, Colossians 1.17. And it explains the reason all men assume uniformity day to day without worrying reality will spiral into chaos, which is a valid worry if atheism is true is because all men know and depend on God as the sustainer. See again Psalms 19.1, Romans 1, 17-23. Christianity explains why we all assume reason is a valid tool, since we all know the God who provided us with a logical, orderly universe, where trusting the mental activities of our head 
actually makes sense. See Proverbs 1.7, Colossians 2.3. It accounts for our trust in empirical learning by explaining all men know the God who created men to know things through observation. See again Romans 19.1, Romans 1.17-23, that all men know God. And Exodus 4.11, Proverbs 20.12, for the fact that God created men to know things through observation. And that all men trust in God to sustain the viability of the senses. Lastly, it accounts for the possibility of knowledge by noting that God provided us with and sustains our universe. See Genesis 8.22, Psalms 103.19 and 104.2, Isaiah 40.26, Jeremiah 31.35, and Amos 8.9. A universe which is conducive for knowledge, that is an orderly, guided, non-chaotic, rational universe, where probability and possibility, which are required for knowledge, actually make sense. It also accounts for why all men assume the possibility of coming to knowledge, by noting that all men know the God responsible for creating the universe, and that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are deposited in Christ, as scripture says. Thus, Christianity must be in order for what is to be what it is. Atheism cannot be in order for what is to be what it is. It will be demonstrated other religions do not account for this type of valid human experience. In demonstrating this, I will refute one of the main objections to presuppositionalism by atheists. I will cover Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, Greek polytheistic paganism, Deism, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, and the ever so popular but fictional green aliens from Mars argument. Doing this helps justify the presuppositionalist view that Christianity alone is the precondition for intelligibility. Islam. Islam and moral absolutes, the precondition for the obligation we all feel to be moral, must be both absolute and personal, since morals are absolute and obligation to be moral only makes sense in interpersonal relationships. Thus, a personal absolute being is required. The Islamic God, Allah, is not truly personal. While the members of the Christian Trinity enjoyed eternal communion and relationship, meaning they have been eternally personal, the Islamic God is Unitarian and has not had relationship for eternity. Therefore, Allah fails as the truly personal precondition of the obligation we all feel to be moral. Another fact that proves the Islamic God is not personal is that the Quran teaches an impersonal, arbitrary fatalism and predestination of people. Islam teaches predestination in texts such as Quran 951 in Sahih Muslim Book 33 number 6406 with no explanation or care for how there is purpose or meaning in this. While the Bible explains God's predestination of individuals has significance, purpose, and meaning. For instance, Romans 9 explains God displays all his attributes of wrath, power, glory, and mercy to his elect by his predestination of individuals to both heaven and hell. This is a loving gift to his elect since God is not required to disclose his attributes to them. Hence, unlike Yahweh, we are left with an impersonal God in Islam who fails to be the absolute and truly personal precondition to make sense of the obligation we all feel to be moral. Islam and the Laws of Logic in order for the Islamic God to qualify as the eternally logical precondition who accounts for the laws of logic, he and his alleged divine book must show themselves to be logical or internally consistent. If they violate the laws of logic through irreconcilable contradiction, then they violate the law of non-contradiction and show Allah is not the source of the laws of logic upon which his nature is based. Do the quote-unquote infallible religious texts of Islam have irreconcilable contradictions? Consider how on the one hand the Quran and Muhammad affirm the validity of the Old and New Testaments of the Bible. See Quran 4, 136, 7, 157, Sunan Abu Dawud, Book 38, Number 4434, and Ibn Ishaq's The Life of Muhammad, page 268. While on the other hand it contradicts the Bible's clear teachings on original sin, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, justification being by faith, and the deity of Christ, etc. Another contradiction is that while Quran 88.6 says that the only food for those in hell will be bitter dari. Quran 69.36 says the only food for the wicked in hell will be pus from their wounds. Since the Quran, which is allegedly from Allah, violates the law of non-contradiction, this means the false Islamic God's nature is not logical and hence he is not the source of the laws of logic. They are not based on his nature. Islam and the possibility of knowledge. The Quran and the Hadith literature upon which the Islamic worldview is based are not texts which offer relevant epistemic philosophical discourses. The Bible, on the other hand, as we've demonstrated, does. Instead, what is contained in the Quran are merely 114 chapters of petty stories, warnings to obey Allah and Muhammad, and a skewed Islamized version of history. 
The Hadith literature contains the actions of Muhammad as well as his extra-Quranic sayings, yet no Hadith even deals with the issue of justification of knowledge through Allah. Since these many volumes of sources do not even touch on this issue, though they make sure to cover all they can, including answering how many rocks a Muslim should use to clean himself after he goes to the bathroom, we can therefore be confident the author of these sources did not have a justification for knowledge. Judaism Judaism, the laws of logic, and moral absolutes. If Judaism is true, then that means the God of Judaism lied when he said the Messiah would come before the destruction of the Second Temple, which he said in Daniel 9.26. The destruction of the Second Temple occurred in AD 70, yet Judaism does not believe the Messiah has come. So, if the God of Judaism is a liar, then he contradicted himself since he stated he does not lie. Numbers 23.19 If he contradicted himself, then he violated the law of non-contradiction, and thus his nature is not logical and the laws of logic cannot be grounded in his eternal nature. Moreover, if he is a liar, which is an immoral characteristic, then moral absolutes are not based on his eternal nature. Thus, he fails as the source for moral absolutes. Moreover, since those who believe in Judaism affirm Unitarianism, this worldview suffers from the same difficulty which Islam does. That is, the God of Judaism is not truly personal. Again, while the members of the Christian Trinity enjoyed eternal communion and relationship, meaning they are truly personal, the God of Judaism is Unitarian and has not had relationship for eternity. Therefore, the God of Judaism fails as the truly personal precondition for the obligation we all feel to be moral. Judaism and the Uniformity of Nature Judaism denies God is an active, sovereign control over the universe. Instead, it says nature simply remains the same way God created it in the beginning. See Maimonides Guide 229. However, this idea does not account for what is true about the uniformity of nature. Nature is uniform for human life and rationality, partly because the material entities of the universe are not merely set in motion, but actively moving about being sustained by God. They exhibit constant action or motion, which shows constant sovereignty and intelligence. For example, consider how atoms, of which all matter is comprised, are always in motion and engaging in patterns. This suggests the constant working of God behind the scenes, as Christianity affirms, not a mere creation and sort of abandonment of the universe, as Judaism teaches. Or consider how in atoms you have constantly active or moving electrons. You also have moving particles in gas, liquids, and solids, though the particles and solids vibrate while held closely together. This type of thing in nature, which was unknown to medieval Jewish scholars like Maimonides, presupposes a sovereign God in complete total control of every minute detail of the universe, not one who sits back and leaves the universe on its own, apart from the odd miracle. Thus, Judaism's rejection of God's full sovereignty over nature proves he is not a valid precondition for the uniformity of nature. Hinduism Hinduism and the Laws of Logic Since Hinduism affirms monism, that is the idea that all is one, and denies differentiation or true distinctions, there are thus no contradictions in Hinduism and hence no law of non-contradiction. This therefore disqualifies Hinduism from being a valid precondition for the Laws of Logic such as the law of non-contradiction. This also applies to and refutes other world religions which affirm monism, for example the New Age, Christian Science, and Hare Krishna. Hinduism and Moral Absolutes Since in Hinduism Brahma, which accounts for the world, is not a person but an impersonal principle, it fails as a precondition for the obligation we all feel to abide by moral absolutes. Again, obligation to be moral only makes sense if we are in personal relationship with an absolute truly personal being. Since Brahma is not a personal being, Hinduism fails as a precondition for the obligation men feel to be moral. This criticism can also be leveled against Taoism and its absolute principle called Taidi, which means great energy. It is impersonal. The same can be said about the principle called Mana, behind the gods of animism. Moreover, Brahma is said to be beyond good and evil, and thus fails as the source of absolute morality we assume and live by. Hinduism and the Uniformity of Nature since monistic worldviews such as Hinduism have impersonal principles which do not control and sustain nature, instead of a sovereign, all-controlling God like in Christianity, Hinduism fails to account for the uniformity of nature. For, in order for the universe to be uniform, it must be guided, sustained, and not chaotic, unpredictable, nebulous, and irrational. Moreover, Hinduism, unlike Christianity, does not account for why all men depend on the uniformity of nature day to day. The Christian affirms all men know God deep down and thus depend on him for uniformity of nature, even though many outwardly profess to deny God's existence due to having a fallen, rebellious nature. Buddhism Buddhism and Moral Absolutes 
In Buddhism, evil is an illusion. This contradicts valid human experience, since we all, for good reason, speak and live affirming things are truly evil. When on the news we hear about a brutal murder, rape, or some other heinous act, we don't say, although this seems wrong, it's just an illusion. No, we know it is wrong, and thus make valid laws against such things accordingly. Moreover, Buddhism is atheistic and hence does not give us a source accounting for where objective moral absolutes come from. Lastly, Buddhism has no personal absolute, which again is needed to account for the obligation men feel to abide by moral absolutes. Buddhism and the Laws of Logic Buddhism denies the existence of the soul while also teaching reincarnation. This is an internal contradiction. What is reincarnated? Thus, by breaking the laws of logic, it fails as a precondition for the laws of logic. Moreover, Buddhism teaches reality is just an illusion. If a worldview claims reality, which would include the laws of logic, is just an illusion, then the laws of logic do not exist and can't be accounted for by such a worldview. Greek Polytheistic Paganism Greek Polytheistic Paganism and Moral Absolutes Although gods in this paganism can be personal, none of them are absolute. They all have different responsibilities and roles in regards to the world. Thus, paganism fails to provide a personal and absolute source required to make sense of the obligation men feel to abide by moral absolutes. Zeus, the so-called father of gods and humans, for example, was said to be finite and had a birth. He is not said to be an absolute control over everything. This critique can also be leveled against animism, other forms of Hinduism, ancient Roman paganism, Shinto, and ancient Egyptian polytheism. Moreover, the gods of Greek paganism were extremely immoral according to Aristides. See Aristides Apology 13.8. They engaged in theft, adultery, and homosexuality, etc. Thus, absolute morality cannot be based on their natures. Greek polytheistic paganism and the laws of logic. In Greek paganism, the Dioscuri brothers, who were twin gods, were honored and exalted as moral helpers of mankind. Yet, they were beings who were said to have ravished the already married daughters of Leochippus. This is a clear violation of the law of non-contradiction in Greek paganism. Either they are moral, noble, and exalted helpers of mankind who deserve respect, or they are not since they are rapists of already married females. If a worldview violates the laws of logic, it cannot be the basis for the laws of logic. Contradictions among these gods shows the laws of logic are not based on the nature of these gods of this system. Deism Deism and the uniformity of nature. Deism suffers from the same difficulty as Orthodox Judaism. That is, there is a God who set the world on its course and then withdrew from it. However, again, due to the nature of the world's utter complex uniformity, which was unknown to the founders of Deism in the 17th century, a totally sovereign God is required to sustain the movement of atoms, the moving parts in atoms, that is electrons, as well as the movement and vibrations of particles and gases, liquids and solids. Due to Deism's absence of providence, it fails as a valid precondition to make human experience on this issue intelligible. Moreover, Deism does not explain why all men assume day to day that nature will be uniform. Deism and Moral Absolutes If a god created the world and then withdrew from it, then the fact that men know right from wrong is inexplicable. If the deistic god does not write his law on the hearts of men at their birth, since he is not around, then man's knowledge of good and evil is unaccounted for. Deism and Knowledge Deism cannot account for the fact that all men know God exists from birth, being the basis for trusting in their mental faculties and a non-chaotic universe as being able to bring them to true knowledge. One deist source said, quote, Deism is knowledge of God based on the application of our reason, unquote. However, people assume God in order to reason and come to knowledge. Deism has it backwards. People do not reason in order to come to the conclusion that God exists. Knowledge of God is innate. This proves deism fails as the precondition for knowledge. Deism and human dignity. Deism fails to explain why men attribute dignity or value to other men the way they do. In deism, men are not in God's image, nor are they viewed by all men as being accountable and owned by a God. Thus, deism does not account for humans attributing dignity and value to other humans. Mormonism. Mormonism and moral absolutes. The Mormon God is an exalted man of flesh and blood. He is not eternal, nor is he absolute. Thus he fails as the absolute personal precondition for the obligation men feel to be moral. Mormonism and the Laws of Logic Since the Mormon God is not eternal, that means he can't account for invariant, that is unchanging, 
laws of logic. If the laws of logic are not based on an unchanging eternal nature, their invariance today is inexplicable. Jehovah's Witnesses Jehovah's Witnesses and Moral Absolutes Since this cult denies the Trinity, their God is not truly personal. For, again, unlike Christianity, they do not have a triune God who has been an eternal personal relationship. Thus, Jehovah's Witnesses do not have a truly personal God required to account for the obligation all men feel to abide by absolute morality. Jehovah's Witnesses and Laws of Logic According to the God of Jehovah's Witnesses, the Watchtower Society takes the role of the Prophet of God. See the Watchtower, April 1st, 1972, paragraph 197. However, the Watchtower claimed 1925 would be the end of the world. See Watchtower, April 1st, 1923, paragraph 106. The Watchtower then admitted its organization was wrong, and a 1925 end of the world scenario was based on the inflated imaginations of Watchtower Society members. See Watchtower 1926, paragraph 232. This is a serious contradiction. Either the Watchtower is a true prophet and makes true prophecy, or it is a false prophet and makes false prophecy. Since this worldview violates the laws of logic, it fails as a precondition for the laws of logic to be true. How can their God inspire prophets to make false prophecy, violating the law of non-contradiction, if the laws of logic are based on his eternal unchanging nature? Green Aliens from Mars when the atheist worldview is reduced to absurdity and shown to not account for valid human experience, the atheist often says, quote, Although you say Christianity accounts for reality, I can just as easily say green aliens from Mars account for it. Unquote. However, green aliens from Mars being the source of the universe is not an actual worldview. Second, if the atheist wants to posit green aliens from Mars as the valid precondition for intelligibility, he needs to actually tell us about this worldview in depth, anthropology, epistemology, view of creation, etc., in order that we can test it internally and see if it actually accounts for reality. Atheists always fail to do this when raising this argument. Thus, their argument does not have any actual force. Moreover, even if they did invent and fully explain such an imaginary worldview, the fact that they do not actually believe it but are just raising it to try to stump Christians shows it is not a meaningful worldview to consider. Christianity has actually been affirmed and believed for 2,000 years, and is not some off-the-cuff response to a transcendental argument. Michael R. Butler's words refute this objection, quote, It can be seen as the last resort of a non-Christian who has just been shown the impossibility of his own worldview, and also shown that the Christian worldview is able to account for human experience. At this point of desperation, he says, Yes, Christianity is able to account for human experience, but there may be another worldview out there that can also provide the preconditions of human experience. This move, however, is of little or no practical value for the non-Christian. In a debate, people argue about actual worldviews, not what may possibly be the case. If Christianity is shown to account for human experience and say naturalism, Buddhism, or Islam is shown to be unable to give such an account, it is of no aid to the naturalist or Buddhist or Muslim to make recourse to some unknown worldview that may like Christianity, provide the preconditions of intelligibility. Bonson's rhetorical comeback hits the mark. Suppose a basketball player, say Michael Jordan, beats every worthy opponent in one-on-one -on -one basketball games. He can justifiably claim to be the best individual basketball player in the world. Suppose further that another jealous and peevish basketball player, who was also previously trounced by Jordan, resents that he, Jordan, has titled himself the best player in the world. His comeback is, just because you have beat every current player does not mean that there is not another one coming who is better than you. Jordan's response can be anticipated. Bring on my next opponent. The theoretical possibility that there may be another player better than Jordan is not a concern to him. In the world of basketball, it is the one who is actually the best player and not who is possibly the best player that is of importance. In the practice of apologetics, things are similar. What matters are actual worldviews, not possible worldviews. Unquote. In sum, when atheists object to Christianity being the precondition for intelligibility by positing other religious worldviews for the sake of argument, or even imaginary worldviews, this is just another example of them rebelling against the creator that they know, and finding excuses and ways to keep suppressing their knowledge of him. However, it is clear, the unbeliever as well as the pagan both require and depend on God deep down, despite erecting idols which shelter them from the truth. That is, for example, false gods, atheist scholars, etc. What the pagan and the atheist need, now that it has been shown that their worldviews are absurd and false, is the gospel. 
The gospel or the good news is that although you have sinned against your God and denied him, thereby incurring his just punishment, remember he is a perfect just judge, there is a way to have your sins forgiven. On the cross, the eternal Son of God, Jesus Christ, died as a sacrifice for the sins of those who repent and believe in him. When you rely on what Christ did on the cross in order to have your sins forgiven and be right with God, then you are saved. This is the greatest truth of this universe that all men need to hear. Now, Christianity is the only worldview that makes human experience intelligible. This includes ethics and morality. We all live our lives as though absolute good and evil exist. We make strong moral judgments. When we hear about a brutal serial killer, child rapist, or terrorist mass murder, or some other moral evil, we do not say, according to our culture this seems wrong, or according to my subjective opinion this seems wrong. No, we strongly condemn them because they are wrong. Morality is not subjective, that is merely agreeable depending on one's personal feelings or fancies. It is objective, that is true apart from individual sense or judgment. This is why strong moral judgments make sense. Moreover, every decent person would agree that child molestation would still be wrong, even if all the other minds on the planet for some reason accepted it to be okay. Thus, morality is also not relative, that is, only true relative to the judging individual and changing circumstances. Instead, it is absolute, that is, existing independently of minds and universally valid. However, atheists, with their view that all that exists in the universe is matter, cannot account for immaterial moral laws existing outside the mind. Only Christianity can. The Christian worldview accounts for moral absolutes by noting there is an eternal personal God who shows us in scripture and in our hearts what is truly good and evil based on his eternal holy character. It is up to the Christian, therefore, to make sense of and explain the absolute standard of right and wrong the atheist knows exists deep down, but can't account for. The Bible said in the first place, you've got to give an answer that does not show the fool that you're going to be sucked into the problems of his worldview. But then on the other hand, you're going to say, well, wait a minute, for argument's sake, okay, let me, let me go with you here. Let's run with this a bit. So let's take your philosophy, and you're saying foolish philosophy. Let's take your philosophy, and let's see what happens if we think of the world this way, if we think of knowledge this way, if we think of ethics this way. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. Lest he think he's got wisdom, lest he think conceitedly that he is able to find out anything about reality, given his philosophy, show him where his philosophy takes him. Good as that which evokes the approval of society is a fairly popular ethical position held by many unbelievers. They claim they believe good and evil because society recognizes good and evil, thus defining morality. However, this position does not make sense of human experience. The German society of World War II believed Jews were a problem and ought to have been isolated and eliminated. Yet the unbeliever who holds to good being that which evokes the approval of society does not hesitate to condemn the actions of Nazi Germany. This means they do not truly believe their concept because the German society defined murdering Jews as something good. Moreover, societies have been documented to have engaged in cannibalism, child molestation, community suicide, and widow immolation, that is, widows burning themselves to death on their husband's funeral pyre. Why do unbelievers strongly criticize and condemn this behavior if they truly believe morality is simply what evokes the approval of society? We ordinarily think of things evoking approval or disapproval, if you want to look at the negative side of ethics. We ordinarily think of things evoking approval because they are good. We don't think of the evoking approval as constituting their goodness. The unbeliever knows in his heart of hearts, and her heart of hearts, that good has to do with matching God's attitude toward things. Evil is that which goes contrary to God's feelings about certain things and against his character. And they use good, the language of goodness and evil, in that absolutistic way, and then they try to find some theory to cover it up. As Paul says, I find that you are very superstitious. You have all of this evidence of uh, ethics around you in your society, and yet you can't make any sense of ethics, given your worldview. And so this God that you worship in ignorance, this absolute standard of goodness that you know is there but you cannot understand, given your worldview, I can declare unto you. The utilitarian will define good as that which results in the greatest amount of happiness for the most people. Whatever results in happiness and not harm is good, according to them. Atheist writer Sam Harris wrote, quote, for there to be objective moral truths worth knowing, there need only be better and worse ways to seek happiness in this world. Likewise, the atheist Dan Barker wrote, quote, Morality implies avoiding or minimizing harm. This is by definition.
However, one must ask, why do these atheists call that which avoids harm moral or good instead of simply socially advantageous, and that which causes harm immoral or evil instead of simply socially disadvantageous? Why is it morally good to reduce the harm of others and evil to cause harm? If atheism is true and people are just matter in motion, or random biological organisms who appeared on a random rock due to unguided chance, in atheism why is reducing harm to random biological organisms actually good? How do atheists know this is good? The atheist knows it is good because on his heart there is God's moral code that reflects his perfect character. By admitting reducing harm or causing happiness is actually good or moral, these unbelievers show deep down they know of a real objective standard of morality that their worldview simply cannot account for. In atheism, is reducing harm of people and causing their happiness good or moral because the atheist says so? If so, why was Hitler wrong? He said what he did was good as well. If the Christian asked the utilitarian why rape is wrong, he would say it is wrong because it causes unnecessary harm to the victim, resulting in a loss of happiness. However, leaving aside the other problems we mentioned, if the Christian then asked the unbeliever why rape would be wrong, if it was known the victim was in a permanent coma and would never feel harm physically or mentally, the unbeliever would not be able to account for the wrongness of the offense anymore with his ethical theory. Empathy, the atheist's commonly espoused basis for avoiding moral wrongs against others, would fail as a sole reason for not engaging in this crime. Yet, the unbeliever would still know the action was wrong and would not engage in it himself for moral reasons. This is because he or she knows things are wrong because such things do not match God's character, not because of empathy only, though that is important too and makes sense according to the Christian worldview. Now, we all show that we know there is an obligation to do what is good, though we often rebel. The question now is not where does conviction to be moral come from, the questions are, where does the authority of absolute morality come from, and why do we strongly feel obligated to that authority? The authority of absolute morality is either personal or impersonal. The atheist cannot hold to the latter view since a random chance universe could not produce an impersonal structure or law that puts forth moral precepts we should be committed to or obligated to. It makes no sense to hold that we ought to be obligated to what some chaotic, arbitrary, random chance system produced. Yet, the atheist knows and shows evidence he is obligated to the authority of moral absolutes, and thus makes strong moral decisions and judgments accordingly. The former view, therefore, that is the authority of moral absolutes is personal, is what makes sense. Obligation and loyalty are related to interpersonal relationships. The reason we all feel obligated to adhere to a basic moral code is because the Christian God we know exists. He is the only God out of all the major world religions who is both absolute and personal. The Christian worldview alone has an absolute personal moral law giver, which is needed to make sense of everyone's obligation they feel to abide by a personal absolute moral standard. Morality is, as we have proved, absolute, that is existing outside the mind, and moral obligation is personal since it only makes sense in interpersonal relationships. Only the Christian God is both absolute, that is existing outside the mind and beyond any legitimate challenge, and personal, for example God identifies with his people, became a man, and is near his people. No pagan god is both personal and absolute. Pagan gods can be personal, but they are not absolute. Islam and Judaism, though they claim to have a personal absolute god, are dependent on the Bible and could thus be deemed Christian heresies, rendering their view of God a mere theft and distortion of the foundational Christian view of God. This leaves Christianity as the only legitimate precondition to make the moral reality we experience intelligible. Thus, by simply making moral judgments and holding things to be right and wrong, the unbeliever proves he's really a rebellious closet believer who knows God. If the atheist was consistent, he would have to agree with the unbelieving Yale professor Arthur Allen Leff, who admitted, according to atheism, quote, there is no way of proving napalming babies is bad. Similarly, the unbelieving secular humanist philosopher Paul Kurtz said the following as a consistent unbeliever, quote, I can find no ultimate basis for aught. This is consistent atheism, yet atheists do not live and speak as if this is true. They live and speak as though morality is absolute and objective, thus contradicting their worldview and borrowing from the Christian one. There's a market for selling humans. Allah says I should sell them. He commands me to sell them. I will sell women. I sell women. <laughs> I think this man says he wants to sell women. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm getting that from him. And I, I've heard people say that this is evil, which we would all agree, a yeah. cancer. The unbeliever cannot escape this. This is again because they are in the image of God, and they know the Christian God exists, and that good is what conforms to his character. They have the words of God's law written on their heart, and thus cannot help but make strong moral judgments, even though their atheism gives them no basis to do so. 
Atheists are living a delusion since while they live as though there is absolute right and wrong, which requires immaterial moral laws, an atheist universe does not allow or account for absolute right and wrong. Only Christianity does. As Van Til explained, the atheist is like a child sitting on his father's lap and slapping and insulting his father. The child is only able to do this because his father is supporting him. Likewise, the atheist is only able to rant against God on moral issues because God is supporting him. It makes no sense to make moral claims denying God, when God is the necessary precondition for morality to even make sense. Romans 2, 14-15 has already made this truth known to man, quote, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness." Unquote. The uniformity of nature and the problem of induction are vital to discuss at this juncture. That nature is uniform is something we all depend on. We do not fear gravity and physics will go out of whack and send mankind flying off the earth into space one day, or cause the words we speak to one day not make sense to those we communicate with. Science depends on the uniformity of nature, for in science we observe, hypothesize, test, and repeat. In order to do science and repeat our experiments, we depend on nature being uniform and not changing. As Bonson noted, science is absolutely dependent on this uniformity, because without it we could not infer from past events what we can expect under like circumstances in the future. Physical science absolutely requires the ability to predict the future action of material entities. Scientific experimentation, theorizing, and predication would be impossible were nature not uniform." Unquote. This leads to the problem of induction, which an atheist worldview cannot answer. How does the atheist, according to his unbelieving worldview, know that the future will be like the past? He can't. Yet he does not fear tomorrow nature will cease being uniform. Everyone assumes the uniformity of nature. And now the question you want to raise is, which worldview makes human experience, that is the expectation that the future will be like the past, that there's a causal connection in this world that you can rely on to make predictions and to plan your life and do things, which worldview makes that human experience intelligible? Now everyone assumes this, but no one's worldview can account for it apart from the Christian. Some unbelievers have tried to solve this problem by saying they know the future will be like the past because past experience shows the future is like the past. However, this still only proves things about the past and not the future. Even the atheist philosopher Bertrand Russell admitted this answer does not solve the problem, quote, Such an argument really begs the very question at issue. We have experience of past futures, but not of future futures. And the question is, will future futures resemble past futures? We have therefore still to seek for some principle which shall enable us to know that the future will follow the same laws as the past. Atheist writer Dan Barker's answer to the problem of induction is that induction based on past events, quote, works enough, unquote, and, quote, is useful, unquote. However, to say induction works or is useful does not do away with the actual problem, which is that atheists do not have a foundation to know the future will be like the past, and thus it makes no sense to depend on the uniformity of nature the way that they do day to day. The unbeliever cannot know the future will be like the past, yet he lives his life as though he knows it will be. He does not fear tomorrow science will not work. He knows if he accidentally hits his knee on the table tomorrow, it will hurt just as it did in the past. This is because deep down he knows the Christian God sustains the universe, keeping it uniform. If the atheist really believed this universe came about by randomness and operates unguided and by chance, then he really has no foundation for living as though the future will be like the past. If he was consistent, he would be very much open to the idea that tomorrow hitting his knee would not hurt. The Christian worldview, on the other hand, accounts for why nature is uniform and answers why we all know and live like the future will be like the past. This is because the God who all men know exists controls everything and keeps nature uniform. In Nehemiah 9.6 we are told, quote, you have made heaven, the heaven of heavens, with all their host, the earth and all that is on it, and you preserve all of them. Also, Matthew 5.45 explains God, quote, makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust, unquote. Moreover, in Ephesians 1.11, we read that God, quote, works all things according to the counsel of his will, unquote. Finally, with regard to God, Colossians 1.17 affirms, quote, in him all things hold together, unquote. As K. Scott Oliphant and William Edgar note, quote, the existence of the God of Christian theism and the conception of his counsel as controlling all things in the universe is the only presupposition which can account for the uniformity of nature which the scientist needs. 
But the best and only possible proof for the existence of such a god is that his existence is required for the uniformity of nature and for the coherence of all things in the world." Unquote. A popular atheist objection to this argument is that since the Christian god is said to do miracles, then that refutes the idea that we can know nature will be uniform in the future and not totally changed from miracles. However, our claim is not that the future will resemble the past in all possible ways, i.e. that there won't be a healing, blessing, or supernatural occurrence now and then, but that based on God's promises and the descriptions about him in scripture, we have justification for the future very much resembling the past in the relevant ways pertaining to the universe being uniform and conducive to human life and science. The Christian has justification for that. The atheist has none. Therefore, miracles pose no real problem for the Christian on this issue. That is to say, every contrary point of view is impossible, philosophically speaking. Every point of view contrary to Christianity is impossible because it doesn't make sense out of human experience or belief. It cannot make intelligible anything in human experience. Where is the philosopher who following non-Christian standards can make sense out of anything, can make sense out of rationality, can make sense out of morality, can make sense out of self-awareness, can make sense out of science, can make sense out of human dignity? Where is the philosophy that does this? It doesn't exist. For God has made foolish the wisdom of this world. Do you believe that? You can take their antagonism and their hostility and what they say against Christianity and show that even that couldn't make sense unless Christianity were true in the first place. That the worldview of Christianity is necessary to make sense even of the arguments of those who oppose it. One of the things you're going to hear people say is, Oh, no, that's not, I can make sense out of my... I'm scientific. I'm rational. I'm a good person. And to that you want to say, yes, you are. Because you live in God's universe and you know God in your heart of hearts. And so you don't live up to your philosophy. What you want to be aware of and what you want to get across to the unbeliever is that he or she has deceived themselves about reality and how we know and how we should live. The laws of logic are immaterial, abstract, universal, invariant laws or rules that govern rationality. The laws are, one, the law of identity, which says that A is A, that is, A cannot be both A and non-A at the same time. For example, a car cannot be all blue and all black at the same time. A thing is what it is. Two, the law of non-contradiction, which says that A is not non-A. In other words, no statement can be both true and false in the same sense and at the same time. For example, a man cannot be both jogging and not jogging at the same time and in the same manner. Finally, three, the law of excluded middle, which says A is either A or non-A. That is, every statement must be true or false exclusively. There is no middle ground. For example, something is either a DVD disc or not a DVD disc. There is no in-between. These laws are not physical objects. The fact that these laws are immaterial, abstract, invariant entities doesn't fit with the atheist idea of a constantly changing universe made up of matter only. Only the Christian worldview can account for them. Atheists, for example Gordon Stein in the Stein vs. Bonson debate, have claimed that the laws of logic are mere human conventions that man agrees upon and lives by. However, certain Eastern traditions do not agree with the laws of logic. Moreover, the laws of logic would remain true even if people were absent and didn't agree on them. If no people were around, a rock could not be all red and all black at the same time. This is thus an abstract or immaterial rule that would still apply. Hence, they are not dependent on people and are not mere human conventions derived from the mind. They are immaterial, abstract, invariant entities. Other atheists, such as Dan Barker, for example, have stated that the laws of logic are merely a function of the brain thinking how it should function, and that such laws do not exist outside the mind. Barker and those like him have to say this because immaterial laws, such as laws of logic, are impossible in a universe comprised of only matter. However, the problem is, if the laws of logic were mere functions of the brain thinking about how the brain should function, then the laws of logic would be different from person to person, since the brains of people and the way people think are different. Therefore, the laws of logic would not be objective and unchanging like they are, if that's all they were. Hence, laws of logic are not mere function of the brain thinking how it should function. As Bonson puts it, quote, The laws of logic are universal and unchanging or else they reduce to relativistic preferences for thinking, rather than prescriptive requirements." Unquote. Other atheists have resorted to denying there are even laws of logic, and attempt to disprove them in order to escape this dilemma. 
However, in order to try to argue and try to disprove the laws of logic, the atheist has to assume and use the laws of logic. They are needed for human thought and speech. For example, in order to claim the validity of the laws of logic is false, one has to assume the law of excluded middle, which says every statement must be either true or false exclusively. The reason the unbeliever speaks in terms of things being either true or false is because he can't escape the fact that statements are either true or false. Clearly, such atheists, because of their faulty worldview, cannot account for the laws of logic, yet the majority appeal to them and depend on them because deep down they know the God responsible for them. The Christian worldview, on the other hand, does account for them. Immaterial, eternal, universal, unchanging laws exist because they are based on the nature of the eternal, logical God. They are how God thinks, that is, they are attributes of God. They are eternal expressions of the eternal God. As Bonson notes, God is the creator of the world and of the human mind. So all intelligibility is due to him. He is the author of all truth, wisdom, and knowledge. The laws of logic which reflect that character are unchanging and unchangeable, in that God cannot deny himself. The Bible validates and assumes these laws of logic which reflect God's nature. For example, God affirms the law of identity in Exodus 3.14 when he says, I am that I am. When Jesus speaking metaphorically says a good tree is not a bad tree in Matthew 7.18, he affirms the law of non-contradiction. And the law of excluded middle is advanced by Christ when he says, He who is not with me is against me. Matthew 12.30 If one is to account for the laws of logic, Christianity must be maintained. Atheism makes such laws impossible and inexplicable or unaccounted for. The laws of logic are crucial to any kind of rational thinking. Education would not make sense. Debating would not make sense unless people were committed, in some sense, to common laws of reasoning as to what controls good and bad uh, conclusions, reliable and unreliable conclusions, and patterns of inference that will lead to the truth. Everyone needs laws of logic in terms of education, debate, argumentation, what have you. And yet the unbelieving worldview cannot make the laws of logic intelligible. Here again, the unbeliever shows that he or she knows God, knows that God is an intelligent, personal, reliable, consistent, faithful being and that they must be like that. They must think logically and consistently, but they don't want to acknowledge God, so they suppress the truth and unrighteousness and come up with some phony theory to explain the laws of logic. Another example showing unbelievers know God and function on that basis, but yet deny him outwardly, relates to the concept of human dignity. The fact that unbelievers value other human beings demonstrates they are not really atheists. For, if atheism were true, and humans were merely random biological organisms who by chance appeared on some random rock, then there would be no real reason to assign to humans the high value we assign to them. The fact unbelievers have funerals for others or get extremely distraught when some actor they like dies, shows they know humans have value. It makes no sense to express man's value or dignity in such ways if all men are, are random advanced animals or stardust. When unbelievers look at another human, even if they do not know them or even like them, they can't help but see in them value and dignity as humans. It is because deep down atheists know there is more to men, and it is absurd to think of them as mere organisms which are products of chance. The unbeliever knows, though he suppresses it, that mankind was created and is made in the image of an infinitely valuable God, and thus has value. He knows humans were created to commune with God as moral agents who belong to and are accountable to God. This is why we all assign value to other humans and are aghast when a psychotic individual or individuals treat humans in evil ways. Valuing human beings makes no sense in atheism if humans are just matter in motion. The Christian worldview, on the other hand, accounts for the value we assign to human beings. In Psalms 14.1, the inspired David said, The fool says in his heart there is no God. You have to be a true fool to through self-deception, tell yourself you do not believe in God, since without presupposing God, you can't account for reason, knowledge, logic, morals, uniformity of nature, man's dignity, etc. Moreover, general revelation, that is creation, testifies to every man that God exists. As David also says, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork, Psalms 19.1. When the unbeliever looks at the magnificence of the sky, stars, moon, sun, the world, animals, humans, flowers, etc., there arises recognition of God's existence and power, which they go on to suppress as fallen creatures. As Frame notes, the unbeliever knows God, and this knowledge influences his thoughts, speech, and actions in varying degrees and ways. In a sense, then, the unbeliever has two presuppositions. He presupposes both truth and falsehood, 
both the reality of God and the unreality of God. His thinking, therefore, is radically contradictory. Unbelieving thought and the rejection of Christian truth leads to absurdity and the destruction of the human mind. As Bonson noted, just examine the sort of scholarly material that is produced by the universities of our land. Existential despair, relativism respecting truth, irrelevance in detailed studies, dehumanizing scientific advances, and a political paper chase. Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? When men are not proper stewards of what God has given them, for example, scholarly ability, then God takes away even that which was previously possessed, for example, making such scholarship vain that is empty. However, Christianity can rescue the broken unbeliever. You are not a random, valueless biological organism, as you self-deceive yourself to think. Morality does have a basis. The laws of logic and the uniformity of nature we live by and assume can be accounted for. Reason and empirical study can be grounded. We can account for knowledge being possible. There is no need to despair, for the atheist worldview is internally inconsistent and makes nonsense of valid human experience. There is hope for the troubled unbeliever. Not only does Christianity give the unbeliever hope and rescue him from the absurdity which his unbelieving worldview forces upon him, but it also offers to him rescue from the wrath of God who he knows deep down. Indeed, our rebellion and sin against God alienates us from him. We have all lusted, stolen, blasphemed God's name, lied, cheated, and hated our neighbor. This is detested by the God we know, the holy just judge, the one we will face when we die. And rightly so, since such things are truly wrong. Living for ourselves and not acknowledging our maker is truly wrong, and quite frankly, insane. And the fact that we fall short every day makes us even guiltier before the holy God we know. However, the eternal divine Son of God, Jesus Christ, was sent by the Father to take onto himself the sin of those who would repent and believe in him. On the cross, Christ willingly paid for the sins of all those who would repent and believe in him. The believer's sins were imputed onto Christ. This was the triune God's act of love for his people. Once one trusts on Christ, their sins are all nailed to the cross and wiped away, and right relationship with God begins. As Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified or declared righteous by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Once one is right with God through Jesus Christ and his work on the cross, God does not simply leave the person in their sinful state. He helps them grow in grace through his spirit to better live a moral good life. As Galatians 5.22-23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law.